the direction um, uh, as, as we sort of work through it. So, you know, that's, that's how it is. But I'll just, I'll just go through the structure as I see it uh, at the moment. But as I say, you know, you can contribute to that, you can shape it. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's an open experiment, uh, with this course, starting now, really. Okay, well, what I was going to do to start off was, um, you know, the, the negative, talk about the negative inspiration for the course, which was, I'm going to play you three things. Now, um, I'm going to have to talk, talk these through because the sound isn't working for a reason, I just can't understand. Um, this is the first one. This is the first thing. Anyone recognise this? Anyone have seen this before? Yeah, I mean, if you, it's sort of, it features in the Steve Jobs film, doesn't it? Uh, has, anyone, has anyone encountered it before that? Um, yeah, I mean, how have you seen it? Where have you seen it? Uh, well, I haven't seen the Steve Jobs film. Oh, so yeah, I've seen Steve Jobs film. No, okay. but I think someone posted it on Facebook, I guess. <laughs> like, I don't have a context to it. I just know that it's uh, this Apple Super Bowl commercial. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely worth watching later with the sound. Um, as I say, I can't fix the sound at the moment. The, the, the imagery itself tells you the story here. Yeah. I mean, I often polemically say this is the most influential film from the last 35 years. Um, it was made by, uh, anyone know who directed that? Ridley Scott. Yeah, so it's Ridley Scott directed it. And you can tell, can't you, that, that it looks very much like, I'll just put it on again. Um, you can tell from the style, it's, it's very similar to um, films that um, he recently made, and particularly, <coughs> like, um, you know, that he, he had to redefine cinematic mainstream Hollywood cinematic science fiction by uh, Alien and Blade Runner from 79 and 82, I think. So this was two years after that. It's really the best film he made since then, I think. It's probably the only significant film he made since then. I think what, you know, what this did really was see the idea of... Um, I, I, um, was see the idea of... Um, that uh, many of, the, of many of the tropes that are now, I think, standard uh, in our imaginary. Um, the idea of um, top-down bureaucratic um, control systems versus the dynamism of, um, of, of a kind of networked individual, you might say. Um, and what is clever, I think, for well, it's certainly significant. I mean, all advertising could say is a form of dream work. Dream work, as Freud says, involves contemplation. And, uh, you know, the, comp the compressing, the condensing of uh, different ideas together. What this does, if you look at the imagery, is it condenses image imagery, Cold War imagery, which none of you really are old enough to actually remember, except historically. Um, um, Cold War imagery associated with the Soviet Union in particular, um, negative imagery of, of, uh, to do with dreariness, um, bureaucratic um, submission of individuals. So if, you, if we look in, the, if you look at the film, you know, they, they, they trudge around um, th these grey drones trudge around, being subjected to top-down. The ultimate kind of top-down commands coming from the, uh, the, the, the talking head. And clearly a reference to 1984 um, of, um, of Orwell, that Orwell I say wasn't too happy about that. Maybe that's another story, we'll leave that aside. Um, but it conflates that imagery that has long been associated with the Soviet bloc um, with imagery. Um, but it, what it wants to also associate it with is uh, imagery to do with big computer corporations, such as IBM, um, you know, which then dominated the, um, which then dominated the, com the computer world. You know, Apple is, Apple is positioning itself as an upstart, 
um, as colour intervening into this grey, dreary, bureaucratic world. So, um, Apple is new. It is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's new, it's female, interestingly. It's colour um, intervening in this grey world of bureaucratic monoliths. Um, where IBM becomes, dream, um, becomes in the advertising dream world equated with the Soviet Union. But this then is the new world that was, is about to break out of this um, monolithic, dreary, um, grey, boring um, control system. And you know, that's what happened, <laughs> sort of, uh, um, in, in its own way. That's, it did, it's prophetic. It was more than prophetic, you could say it was hypersticial. It helped to bring about the very, the very thing which it was describing. Um, from, our, from my point of view, what I think is interesting about this then is the way in which it suggests um, a, there's a problem of desire in terms of um, capital. You think about the Cold, the, 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 the Cold War image. What it's suggesting is there is no um, real desire for uh, or rather, there is there is only desire for capitalism. The 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 communist world, like IBM um, and the corporate, the then you know the, the then dominant corporate capitalist world, um, is is boring and dreary. And that's that's an objection to it. Um, the new capitalist world won't be like that. The new capitalist world will, will be about design in a way that the, the, the communist world can't, won't be. Um, so that's, that's part of the interest to me in that. The, as I say, I, took, I put the, um, the PowerPoint up on the, um, on the VLE so you can watch it with sound like It's just inevitable you get these like, problems. Uh, actually, immediately just proving the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the underlying message of that Apple and Microsoft are looking smooth and, and glitch free, which we spent five minutes here, you know, that isn't the case, right? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I can't see any reason why the sound isn't working, but then that's, it isn't. Um, right, this, the second thing I wanted to show was um, the, this commercial um, from I think it's a similar time. Um, <coughs> anyone see this one? Yes, notice he has a in his case. With the face, the then the leading kind of style bible, the, the leading magazine of style culture in, in London. Here he is in this dreary Soviet world. It's all black and white. Look at his miserable flats that he's going. That he's going, going to. Going to say, look. His life <laughs> is within because he's, he's managed to smuggle the Levi's into uh, into the Soviet Union. And you know, this was a real. This wasn't just something made up for commercials. The Levi's did have that super super fetishized quality uh, in in the Soviet Union. Um, so again, what is this pointing to? The fact that it's not only that the the Soviet bloc was um, repressive. Um, politically repressive, it also inhibits design and blocks design. Um, so, you know, th this was from the, um, so these were being developed, these, these commercials came out then at the, uh, the high point, <coughs> well, the end of the, the, what in retrospect we can see is to, towards the end of the Cold War. It didn't seem like it was towards the end then, in the middle of the 80s actually, the collapse of the Soviet Union um, and the, the Soviet system was so quick. Uh, at the end of the 80s. Um, no one would have foreseen it in the middle of the 80s. It still felt like a, a, a 
full-on uh, Cold War that would continue for decades at, at that point. Um, so, the, so, the, so, no, there's, um, so, so those came from that period. Third thing I was going to show you, which is no point showing you at all without the sound. Yes, Lou? It was shown in the UK. It was, made, it was, it was a UK ad. Yeah, yeah. It was made for, for the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is um, this is a former Tory MP and um, so-called chicklet author Louise Mensch. I can't believe she called it Mensch. I mean, it's, it's like a it's like a, it's like, a it's like a daft Martin Amis character, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, Louise Mensch, um, who appeared on, I find that news for you, the fairly lame satirical BBC uh, politi political show um, at the time of Occupy London. And what she famously claimed um, was that these, the protests at Occupy had no um, authenticity or validity because they had, they went into uh, Starbucks and, and also maybe they had iPhones. Um, Certainly others said that. They've got iPhones, therefore they can't be really anti-capitalist. So I think that, so there's a lineage, isn't there, I think, from that, those first two commercials into the Louise Mensch position. Um, and it's a, a, there's a narrative behind it, which is a story about Bazaar, again. They have the, you know, these protesters have the products of advanced capitalism, therefore, it's not only that the hypocrites is that they don't really want what they say they want. You know, they don't really want a world beyond capitalism. What they want is um, really just uh, the, the, all of the fruits of capitalism. Uh, and ultimately, that's why capitalism will win. Because they may claim ethically that they want to live in a different world. But libidinally, the level of desire they're committed to living in um, the, the current capitalist world. Okay, so this is a kind of negative, so these three things, sorry about the sound, are the, are the <coughs> negative inspiration really for um, the cause. Um, where I'm going to say, you know, there is a design for or at least pose a question, is there really a desire for, for something beyond capitalism? Um, and partly this is informed then by recent debates on accelerationism in this guy, but probably the biggest um, influence on, on the course, um, which I uh, was introduced to uh, two phases really. The second, the first was in the 90s when I was exposed, closely exposed to the work of Nick Land, who we'll look at later, a very controversial figure, who developed a form of um, <coughs> capitalistic, I don't want to call it right wing exactly, capitalist accelerationism. His idea was that capital was the um, most intense force ever to exist on Earth, that the whole of terrestrial history. Um, had led to the um, emergence of this um, effectively planetary artificial intelligence system, um, which therefore can be seen as retrospectively guiding all of history towards its own emergence, a bit like uh, Skynet and in the Terminator films. Um, so Lang's work has this intense poeticization of the power of capital. I mean, it's interesting that came out in the 90s at the moment of the, you know, the high triumph of capital uh, after the collapse of the Soviet system uh, at the end of the 80s. Um, so Land, Land's work was um, a really a play on a development of um, earlier, was a kind of remix of an earlier, um, actually ostensibly left-wing thought, um, you know, particularly the work of Deleuze and Guattari and um, Leotard. And they try to think through a way of um, they try to try to um, imagine precisely a kind of post-capitalism that, that would not involve um, retreating from capitalist modernity but going all the way through it. Um, is there? Sorry, this is awful. <laughs> it's 
Yeah. Try and be arranged differently next week. Um, and it really, it was, it, it, in, it was in the last few years that um, that, that left-wing idea of accelerationism um, has, uh, well, the, the term accelerationism itself was meant initially as a negative term by Benjamin Noyes' book, The Persistence of the Negative. Um, it was repurposed by Alex Williams and um, Nick Cernak. That's how we pronounce it. <laughs> so that, that's, um, which was from what her horse's mouth. Um, I think his ans uh, Nick's ancestors, when they moved to Canada, gave up trying to get Canadians to pronounce it correct. Um, but anyway, so the, you know, were they. Um, Try to repurpose this idea of accelerationism, this move into post capitalism from a left wing perspective. And actually, there was, a, there was a seminar here, a symposium here at Goldsmiths, um, I'm not sure, four or five years ago, um, where Nick and Alex, I think, really started to develop those ideas. Um, so the, the, that basic question, the question behind you know, the, a lot of the debates surrounding accelerationism. Uh, you know, is is post-capitalism imaginable? Uh, is uh, is it possible to retain some of the kind of libidinal and technological infrastructure of capital and, and get, move beyond capital? That is what you know. That's the they're the debates that have shaped my thinking over the last few years. Or, or what's probably one of the most important debates that shaped my thinking, and which therefore also shape the structure of the course. I just briefly go over the thinking of the. The, the, st the structure of the, the, the 15 weeks. Um, so this week I'm looking at, we're looking at the three, three different accounts of post-capitalism. What is post-capitalism? I don't think we'll know by the end of today, but we'll hear a bit, we'll hear about, we'll, we'll hear a bit about the three, three different accounts of post-capitalism. Nick and Alex's, um, Gibson Graham's, and um, Paul Mason's. Paul Mason's kind of syncretic account really based on lots of different theories. I mean, um, and, and I think the reading for this week is kind of typical of a mix of reading that I, I sort of want on the course, which is uh, some, somewhat theoretical, somewhat journalistic, um, also some sort of cultural and political history as well. So it's, um, it's not a heavily theoretical course, I don't think. Um, or at least it's not theory as such every week. So this week, the general introduction. Then I, I'm taking a broadly, after that broadly kind of um, chronological approach. So um, part of what I want to look at is, um, I think which is a lot of what's behind the accelerationist debates, but hasn't really come out into the open, which is to do, to do with a, a kind of more aesthetic side of the, the question. Um, which is about, and which I think we can see, certainly the, the work of Leah Tartelers and Guattari, etc., uh, in the 70s, to some extent emerging out of, um, which was the pressure coming from the counterculture of the 1960s and into the 70s. Um, the, the potential fusion of the counterculture with the left. And now we hear about this a lot from May 68 and all of that. I kind of displacing May 68 a little bit um, in, in the narrative of this course. More interested in um, the 70s in lots of ways, um, which you'll see in a minute. The 70s in the US partly, but also the 70s in Italy. Um, and yeah, to think about what would happen if this fusion of the counterculture and left-wing politics had been more successful. Oh, had persisted. I mean, there was some. There was, it did. We'll look at some moments where it flourished temporarily, um, but it didn't persist. It didn't persist. And in fact, you know, the period that we're looking at is the period of neoliberal triumph. Um, so what I what I want to look at next week is um, two approaches that I've been marking them. What I'm seeing is which figure in the counterculture. Marcuse's book, um, Eos and Civilization, is incredible. I mean, I realized actually when I was thinking about this over the weekend, um, 
I've already mentioned Deleuze and Guattari a couple of times, but they're not on, not on the reading. They are the kind of spectres of, uh, behind a lot of what, what we're doing. It's almost perverse of me to leave them out, I think. But, uh, you know, that it's because they're there anyway in a certain, certain form. But also, but also because I also think it's interesting to look at Marcuse as a kind of precursor of Deleuze and Guattari with the question of um, you know, taking on Freud and, and, and desire and the question of desire. He does this incredible book, Heroes and Civilization, out of print. Interestingly, like a lot of um, Marcuse's work now is out of print. Marcuse, from being, you know, selling hundreds of thousands of copies of One Dimensional Man, still in print, is major, regarded as a major work. Now, um, as I say, a lot of his work out of print. I think Marcuse, you know, Marcuse is widely read in the counterculture because his work anticipated a lot of the strands of the counterculture. So next week I want to play that off against um, Alan Willis, who's a, a journalist and cultural critic who lived through the Kennedy Club, um, and but we also saw some limitations of it. Um, and in, what I particularly like about uh, Alan Willis, this piece by Alan Willis, is it you know raises the question of what um, we'll look at later, what Helen Hester calls domestic realism, which is a bit parallel to what I call I call capitalist realism, i.e. the idea that um, Domestic structures, the way we organise our lives at home, are, are, are fixed and immutable, and we can't imagine them uh, being any different. In the 60s, in the counterculture, people did try to live in a different, try to live in a different way, try to live in a, a, a more collective, uh, communal way. It didn't work out. Uh, it, you know, it stalled. It, it failed. It went wrong. Interestingly, uh, Willis's argument is public, part of the problem was impatience. That um, you know, people did, that people thought that you could overcome these structures um, very quickly. In fact, you know, they um, they're highly tenacious and will reassert themselves unless they're continually dismantled. Um, okay, so that's so that's setting up certain coordinates then between the counterculture and and the left. And I think that's the kind of democratic socialism or libertarian communism that Marcuse wanted, and Marcuse was a heavy critic of um, yeah, actually existing kind of Soviet system. And, and part of what I also want to think about this course then, um, module as you call it, uh, is um, the question of consciousness, which I think has receded uh, in, in recent years. Um, you know, what, what I call capitalist freedom, you could say, which is in a way the shadow of this course, uh, it's called post-capitalist design, but also about capitalist realism, the rise of capitalist realism. Um, as capitalist realism rises, as the idea that there's no alternative to capitalism uh, becomes the kind of ambient political assumption, uh, as that rises, you can uh, in order for that to be the case, consciousness has to recede. Um, you know, consciousness in the sense of um, initially as theorised by Luke Hatchett in terms of class consciousness, but um, Nancy Hartzell's uh, invaluable work on um, socialist um, consciousness from a socialist feminist angle broadens this out from a question of not just class consciousness, but of I would say of subordinate group consciousness um, and the importance of this. Now, Marcuse, in the se section of reading which I've given for week um, two, talks about the spectre of society which could be free. And I think this is almost a proto accelerationist section of his work, where he's saying, okay, once scarcity is, the problem of scarcity is resolved, which, is, which, is, um, which effectively is, and, and, under late capitalism. There, the, it's not, the problem is not that there isn't enough food to feed everybody. The problem is the distribution of the food, right? The problem, the, 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 the scarcity isn't the problem. It's actually the ma maintaining of scarcity that is the problem for, for capitalism. Or the, the, the production of an artificial scarcity um, in, order to, in order to conceal abundance, you could say. Um, and, you know, scarcity of time is uh, as much as scarcity of actual um, um, goods, um, services, etc. And I think it's part of it. Now, Marcuse says once you know once the scarcity is overcome, 
you know, capitalism has to work extremely hard at um, avoiding the possibility that people could d determine their own lives uh, and behave in a more uh, autonomous way. Um, so this is, in a way, the driver of the emergence of capitalist realism, I would say. Um, the of neoliberalism as part of that is, you know, constantly having to thwart the potential of, you know, of the emergence of post-capitalism, of people um, living in um, ways that are beyond the imperatives of capitalism. But Stephen Gibson and Graham argue we're all, lots of ways already doing that, or most of the time, in fact. Um, but, okay, so that, that's... So that, in a way, it becomes a problem of inhibiting the emergence of consciousness. So I want to sort of seed that in week three with the reading from Mukherjee and Hartley's Chair. Then we'll condition a lot of that, um, what we'll do in weeks after that. Um, okay, so week four is um, cultural and labour history. It's an incredible moment in the early 70s when, uh, in the US, <clears throat> A lot of these currents came together with a new kind of uh, a new kind of set of demands in the workplace. Um, and when civil rights, um, feminism, uh, and class struggle came together in a kind of you know when we use the word intersectionality now, it just means horrible squ squabbles on Twitter, people, people calling each other out, you know all of that kind of thing. Well, remember, actually, <coughs> it's simply about a problem where things don't actually intersect properly. Um, where, you know, the, um, instead of development of a kind of consolidated group, subordinate group consciousness, there are, you know, identitarian squabbles amongst these groups. Well, what if the opposite was the case? What if, um, what if it had been possible to develop um, a form of um, political struggle which would genuinely intersect all of these forms of subordination in order to overcome them? You know, there were hints of this in the US in the early 70s. It's a great book, this, I think. There are great books of kind of cultural um, <clears throat> theory, there's so many theories, cultural and political history of recent years. Jefferson Carey's book, um, Staying Alive, the late 70s and the last day of the working class. A book of two halves, very much. The first half devoted to um, you know, these kind of positive explosion of libertarian um, communism, kind of existential leftism. Etc. Um, and the second half about really the defeat of um, the defeat and, and, uh, of the, the the new left as, as well as the old left. The old left was kind of swindled, um, um, and the new left was was stymied. Um, following on from that, then um, Leotard's text, um, the design name Marx. Um, from his infamous, what he called the latest evil book, um, Le Visual Economy. Um, this, um, it's, you know, it makes the case for, um, well, it, a particularly strong case for the idea there's no, <coughs> there's no possible retreat from capitalism, because there's no primitive, there's, there's no space of primitive outside to which we can return. We have to go all the way through capitalism. And he makes this claim super simple. Um, then a focus on um, Italy, where Federici and um, Nicholas Fabian's account of the refusal of work. Um, so we'll see how some of this this played out uh, on the ground, in, particularly uh, in, in Italy in the seventies. The next few weeks after that, we we'll devote to the kind of counter-revolutionary um, where we see post-capitalist desire in negative. I think by the shadow it casts by, you know, if if, if we can talk about uh, this, um, the last 30, 40, well, last 40 or 50 years now, as being shaped by the spectre of the society, a uh, spectre of a world which could be free, um, then. We can see that spectre in the ways in which capital thwarts, has set, up, uh, set itself up to thwart the emergence of you know, the consciousness, um, autonomy, and refusal of work, you could say. Um, and 
the, the testing ground for that, the horrific testing ground for that is, uh, first of all, Chile. Um, democratic Socialist Project, close to the US, um, very different from anything to do with the Soviet bloc, technologized, had a, the so-called socialist internet, CyberSyn, uh, in place. Um, destroyed, I mean, it, it, you know, the, 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 it can't be said that, um, oh, it didn't work. It didn't, oh, the chip didn't work, what happened in Chile? Well, it didn't, it didn't work because it was, it was it, the CIA backed Q to destroy it. There's a military destruction of, um, um, of, of the, um, and a uh, government in Chile, to, and which I think then provides a kind of prototype for what would happen afterwards. Um, in places like the UK, um, wasn't quite so uh, immediately violent. I mean, there was violence, um, the minor strike, etc. Um, but you know, there was a kind of lab, um, um, there was a kind of capitalist realist lab which allowed. Um, capital to experiment with these new forms of, of subjection. Okay, um, and week eight, we'll look at uh, what I've called the invention of the middle, um, and which will be based on Carl Friedman's book, The Age of Nixon, and Penny Lewis's book, um, uh, Hard Hats, Hippies and Hawks. Uh, in a way, this is, this, this is about um, the development of Suppression of consciousness again. Um, suppression of specifically of class consciousness. Um, and the, the role I think that Nixon played in this, if you, if you read um, uh, Carl's book, is in really generalizing what, a, a form of what Marx had characterized as petty bourgeois psychology, um, which is the idea of being both um, being in a, a class position which sets you outside <coughs> class altogether. There, are there is a class system, but you don't really belong to it. And um, Nick, this was the appeal that Nixon made to people, the so-called middle America, um, which you know, encouraged people to see themselves uh, as a part of this petty bourgeois, and from this petty bourgeois perspective, which can be then be generalized um, as a form of suppressing class consciousness. So workers started to see themselves uh, as um, in terms of the petty bourgeoisie, and Nixon could plausibly make this pitch because of his own background. You know, he, he, unlike Kennedy, for instance, he didn't come from a very privileged background. He sort of worked his way up, and this is key to the petty bourgeois psychology: the idea that you can work your, you, 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 you know, you can produce your own position in society through hard work. Um, and We'll look at the way in which that um, Nixon's, despite his own ultimate kind of humiliation and um, failure, nonetheless the kind of Nixon paradigm became a uh, something which is continued to this day. And Thatcher, was very, Mrs. Thatcher, was very similar to Nixon in lots of ways. Similar background, similar values, similar you know ad ad advocacy of kind of this general petty bourgeois psychology. Um, and we'll see how that played out in terms of, well really this, this image of hard hats versus hippies. Um, I think it was 1970, early 1970, some construction workers famously attacked anti-Vietnam War protesters, producing this image of a kind of reactionary working class versus the, the versus kind of a, effete students, you know, um, which is, continues to this day, really. Um, and, and, and the work is somehow then on the side of the middle, of the, of the silent majority uh, of middle America, etc. And it's production of a middle then, a middle which is, 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 is a paradoxical space, space, right? How can everybody belong to the middle? Um, they, have, it's impossible. You know, when um, John Prescott, the new Labour, um, Politician said, uh, "Yeah, we're all middle class now. Well, look, everyone's middle class. What is it in the middle of?" But it, this, you know, but, but, but it seems to make sense. This pitch, um, and um, you know, as a form of 
Yeah, sup direct suppression of class consciousness. Um, then we'll go into the post fordism in New Times. Um, Stuart Hall theorizing New Times uh, from one perspective. Vienna and, 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 and a lot of the Italian kind of um, post autonomous theorizing it for another. And so the post fordism then is the, uh, the big shift in the um, infrastructure of capitalism. You know, a shift towards um, what we now call precarity, um, certainly flexibility, flexibilization, casualization, etc. Uh, and info technology becoming central. Um, so look at that there. Uh, um, in week nine, week ten, um, techno feminism, cyber feminism. Um, This then is part of the genealogy of accelerationism, I think, was cyber feminism, um, or techno feminism of Firestone, who really thought that um, a lot of the problems of gender were ultimately material and technologically resolvable. Um, you know, so for instance, once children, once it's possible to have children born from artificial wombs, um, you know, that would obviously radically shift um, gender relations, etc. Um, compare her to Sadie Plant from the 90s, which can be regarded as in some ways perhaps a neoliberal form of um, cyber feminism. Sadie Plant worked closely with Nick Land uh, in the 90s, actually. I've skipped out um, the most famous kind of cyber feminism on Haraway, because I think you probably know about that anyway. You just look at either side of that, I think. Um, and you can fill that bit in yourself. It's better to let us retire with it. Um, it can be added in as a, the extra bit. Then we'll add it. Not to accelerationism, which I, um, I haven't chosen Nick and Alex because we, Nick and Alex because we looked at that now. And it will sort of inform the rest of that, inform the, um, the whole of the course, really. Well, we'll look at uh, this, um, we'll have a look at Jameson's piece, it's Utopia's Replication, where he makes the famous, well, not yeah, famous, some, some famous game, that, uh, for, that looking at Walmart as a form of utopia. Um, dialectical thinking, um, really classic accelerationist move, which is to say, what if the infrastructure of Walmart was repurposed for entirely different purposes? So bad things. Repurpose for entirely different ends. Um, and Nick Land's machine desire, which is a kind of classic statement of his form of uh, accelerationism. So it's a kind of left and right accelerationism I'm, I'm closing there. Um, so a lot of the accelerationist debate actually came out of the impasses of failures of um, the political, anti capitalist political movements since. Um, 2008, um, you know, and part of that is to do with horizontalism. You know, the idea that um, horizontalism, which was a uh, critique of the idea of um, hierarchical structures. That there's something problematic about the hierarchical structures uh, a, a, a political organisation. Um, when they are instantiated, they're already oppressive. So we must, if we want to prefigure a post-capitalist world, we must be horizontalist. We must in other words, be flat. There mustn't be we must work to, to always eliminate um, hierarchies where they appear. Um, a lot of the accelerationist stuff, as I said, the left accelerationist stuff came out of a dissatisfaction with it. Um, but part of this thinking is then a kind of fusion of uh, anarchist currents with um, network theory. Um, and one example of this is, you know, this kind of peer to peer <coughs> politics, which is week 13, and Michelle Bowers is probably the most famous example of that. And um, uh, we'll, you know, the, the most famous thinkers of the network uh, are part of Negri, really, the kind of uh, unofficial theoretical. Um, 
non-hierarchical way of putting this. The, uh, the, the, the inspiration is probably the best way of, uh, behind um, artificial <coughs> intelligence. Um, but also, you know, the, the heart and Negri, of course, had been involved in Italy in the 1970s with autonomy and, um, you know, those struggles. Um, and, you know, so there's a direct lineage back to the sort of stuff we looked at earlier. Um, now we'll look at Jody Dean's critique of this. Um, so we spent two weeks looking at the network. Uh, first of all, a long section from uh, Commonwealth, which I think is their best book, actually. Um, and um, then we'll look at Peer to Peer, we'll look at Jody Dean's critique of this. Um, week 14, back in the bleak. Um, touch screen to capture, so I called it. Um, then looking at Baudrillard, I think it's astonishingly prescient um, account of the tactile power, as it calls it. They come to touch. <coughs> read a lot of those passages from the, the 70s, and they read this astonishingly like he's time traveled into now, he's talking about Twitter and um, touch screen interface. Um, next to that. Franco Berardi's famous um, critique of um, current conditions of uh, info labour precarity. Um, Berardi on a few temporary thinkers who takes both of our series. Then to end on a more positive note, um, Prometheus reborn, although that's probably too organic a way of putting it, um, uh, with, I think some of these currents come together in an exciting way in the Zeno Feminist Manifesto from 2015, uh, so it's only last year, and Helen Hester's piece, um, Promethean Labels and Domestic Freedom. Um, I think this offers all, all kinds of exciting possibilities for um, a kind of post capitalist politics at the current moment. So we'll end up trying to end up more positive. Okay, so that's the thinking behind the whole, the whole structure. Um, Any questions on that one? I mean, you just interrupt me any time. Um, I hope this, I hope I don't speak as much in the future weeks, but I need to be more Does that sort of make sense anyway? Does that, um, okay, so is that sort of what you're expecting? Or anyone crushingly disappointed with that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, what's, what's absent from I think is a little bit is, is what I, I want to be more present and perhaps if you, you know you can bring this in is the question of aesthetics, and artwork, and culture and its role in um, in all of this, which I think is, is key. Um, and you know, had been underestimated perhaps by the, the elements of the so-called old left. Um, right, let's go on to, to let's go on to today then. Um, to never get through everything we've got here. Uh, but let's, I've just basically summarised some of the key claims. Um, oh yeah, before we even get to that, I've got okay, way too much stuff, to never mind. It's better to have too much than too much. Okay, so what are the advantages of the concept of post capitalism? Just initially, I think it's worth thinking about this. Um, why, why use the term post capitalism rather than communism, socialism, etc.? Well, first of all, it's not tainted by association with past failed and oppressive projects. Um, so, you know, the term post capitalism has a kind of neutrality that is um, it, it, it not there with, with the communism and socialism, but that's just partly generational, I think, that the word communism has lots of negative associations for people of my age, and I'll even if you want to overcome them. Um, but, uh, anyway, sorry, you want to ask a question? Oh, I was just going to ask quickly if yeah. these slides are online. The slides are online. Uh, yes, I was going to say that, actually. Don't, so don't, don't worry about copying everything down. <laughs> they should, just want to, uh, sometimes people want to write, <laughs> just focus their attention, but... In terms of the, you know, the slides are online, I've put them in fact, I've just pulled this up in It implies victory, uh, that's the other thing, isn't it? If you're talking about post-capitalism, it implies 
that's it, there is something beyond capitalism. And it also implies a direction, doesn't it? But if it's post-capitalism, it's something that's coming up, it's a victory, and it's, it's a victory, and it's a victory that will come through capitalism. And it's not just opposed to capitalism, it is what will happen when capitalism has ended. Um, it starts from where we are, so it starts from, uh, it's not some entirely separate um, space, I think that's implied by the concept of post-capitalism, is something that develops out of capitalism, I mean, it develops from capitalism, moves beyond capitalism, therefore we're not required to imagine this space of sheer alterity, because pure outside, we're not, we're, we're, that's not, that's, that's um, that's not the emphasis of And we can begin with, you know, the, so we can work with the pleasures of, of capitalism as well as its impressions. So, you know, we're not, we're not necessarily trapped in this Louise Mensch world where, you know, if we have iPhones, we can't want post capitalism. But I don't think we we'll want iPhones in post capitalism. Anyway, yes. But doesn't it um, sound a bit more like a theory strang in comparison to, like, instead of a political system? It sounds more know? like a theory. Yeah. Mm. Okay, that's a potential problem with it. Yeah. Actually, I've got a few problems with it. That's more I mean, I don't know. But that is, yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, yeah, I sort of said that in uh, the first one, uh, or, or the two. I think that's sort of, I'm touching on that in the second one there, but I think that's. I think you're making a slightly different point. Um, but that's because, important. like, socialism and communism yes. has kind of an active. Yes, but I mean, it's a positive so. project, yeah, yeah, positive actual project. Um, whereas post capitalism, yeah, it might be too, it might be too theoretical. Also, I mean, it's tied to capitalism. That's, that's also a problem, right, potentially. Um, you know, Gibson went and talked about capitalocentrism. Uh, I, if we're talking about post-capitalism, then if we're, if we're framing out kind of political, um, cultural, social ambitions in terms of post-capitalism, we're still defining the relation to capitalism. Um, so it doesn't name a positive project. I mean, that's, I think, related to the first one and related to what Stephen said. It remains in the temporality of the post. Um, in, so. In a, so it sounds like postmodern, um, you know, this, it, it, it remains defined by something which preceded it, rather than what it actually is itself. Um, it's not necessarily progressive, it's new book on verso, for futures like after capitalism, I think some of this is online. Um, just, just because something's post-capitalist doesn't mean it is desirable. Extinction is one of the phrases, <laughs> models for post-capitalism. Um, another is kind of kind of high rent, um, super capitalist, uh, kind of high rent form of um, accumulation that is in some sense not capital anymore. Um, okay, so I mean, we might add to these, and you probably you might have some of your own. Yeah, please. Yeah, I have to. Two more, uh, two more problems, or two. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it is not only that it does not name a positive project, but it does not uh, also name a negative project. For example, some negative aspects of capitalism yeah. that we would want to refuse. Like I have in my mind the strategies of uh, refusal of refusal of uh, the autonomies, for example. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also, it is really easy to be lost in, inside this prefix of post, you know, in yeah. some postmodern narrative, I don't know, uh, not to define anything, anything at all, just talk about some post content that we fall yeah, from yeah. the sky. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, so I think these are potential issues with, with, with the concept. Um, right, good, yeah, so that's, so we can think about these as we develop, we probably have more which we can add as we carry on. But something you might like to write on this anyway, just sort of generally, is the, you know, is the concept of post-capitalism good, or you know, is it worth persisting with? 
Um, I mean, I'm alternating. I, I was family and I was family against using anything to do with communism um, uh, a few years ago because of, because of the tainting problem. I think more than more than anything else. But I've been persuaded that um, you know it's the, it's the very antagonism, the very alterity of the term communism that um, you know makes it. No, give you potential should, power. What? Sorry, why should it be like communism anyway? Like, I mean, to use like an old. Yeah, well, I think I think I think my I think like when it is paired with new talents, I think that um, that that's what makes it interesting. Like this emerges of things like luxury communism as a as a formula because it, it it's immediately. I think we'll, maybe we'll talk about luxury communism later on the course. I think. Um, I think what's powerful about that is that it deflects or, or diffuses, or rather, ex I think not diffuses, the opposite, explodes the current conceptions of things, um, or the, the standard <coughs> stereotypes. Like exactly what we looked at with that dreary grey imagery to do with the communist so Soviet system. How could that be luxury? So it's kind of it's a cognitive bomb, I think, something like luxury communism. I've also been trying to work on the concept of acid communism, um, which uh, was, it is kind of what emerges, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it is, that's what the Lodge of Wittol is, uh, you know, it's, it's it, and that's what uh, some of the things we look at in the um, thing with the Jefferson County stuff, the early 70s, you know, um, psychedelic consciousness plus class consciousness, you know, um, that's what the, 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 the capital, capital fear in those ways in the early 70s, was in the late 60s, early 70s. What if the working class become hippies? You know, um, you know because that, that, you know, the, the, surely key to, to counterculture, for all its failings and had many, you know, was anti, an anti-work ethic, mainstreaming anti-work ethic, which the Beatles did, stay in bed, float upstream, you know. Um, was anti-work, and also, you know, this question of, um, well, anti-work, and and kind of anti-business, anti-being busy, kind of different existential mind. And also, you know, um, this question of communal living. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, so um, I guess now my current position would be, yeah, use communism with a modifier to break out of the existing associations, um, which a lot of young people don't have anyway. As I said, um, but you don't seem happy with that. Yeah, no, I think it's super difficult, no, because yeah. I mean, there was a socialist system, and I mean, if you're in Germany or in Austria or whatever, like you still kind of know what it was about, and it's just very difficult to yeah. work with those. So, I think it's partly a strategic terms. question, isn't it, about where, when these terms can be used, in what context, what, yeah, yeah, no, of what force they can exert, and what, you know, there may be that. Um, it may be that they, you know, that they, that they're not, they don't have universal applicability. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so right, so this is these are big questions, but let's turn to specifics then. Of um, oh no, this even more right. <laughs> so I got this from line. See the range of um, different forms of post-capitalism, and um, almost none of those I'm talking about. Um, it's worth looking at um, later in more detail if you want to. But, um, okay, so let's let's look at some of the, some of the reading from today. Um, so Gibson Gray, one of the key points there. Um, okay, so I think one of the important things that they highlight is the problems on the left of. Facing any attempt to theorise, imagine, imagine is probably better, I think, the word than, than theorise, <coughs> the way out of capitalism. So for them, there's this suspicious, paranoid, strong theory, which they get from this concept from Sedgwick. Affords the pleasure of recognition of capture of intellectually subduing that one last thing offers no relief or exit to a place beyond. If we want to cultivate new habits of thinking from post capitalist politics, it seems there's work to be done to loosen the structure of feeling. I cannot live with uncertainty or move beyond hopelessness. Okay, so 
that's, that's, a, that's a kind of pathology. What we're saying then, Gibbs and Graham, is that this is a pathology of the left itself. Um, and you know, this associated left melancholia, um, just if people have not, if people have not read. Um, <laughs> um, I think people have not read um, Wendy Brown's essay on left melancholia. Um, it's really, really worth looking at. That's what they're referring to extensively here. Um, so, I mean, as, as they put it, in which attachment to a past political analysis or identity is stronger than the interest in present possibilities of mobilization and means of transformation. Rather than grieving and letting go, the melancholic subject identifies with lost ideals experiencing their absence as feelings of desolation and dejection. Um, we come to love our left passions and reasons, our left analyses and convictions more than we love the existing world that we presumably seek to alter. Um, yeah, so there's, I mean, it's, I think anyone who's in, had any encounter with left-wing politics will recognise these pathologies. So, um, you know, fixation on the past. Um, and, 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 and which I think is related then to this problem of inability to deal with the contingencies and uncertainties of the present. Um, so, you know, one, so there's a clear relation really between paranoid, paranoid total theory, which in effect says nothing can happen. I mean, it's what I call a harsh Leninist superego, I think is related to this. The harsh Leninist superego. He was out in force when, when, when Syriza emerged in Greece. Harsh land super ego, this isn't going to work. We didn't work. But it was better that it was tried than it wasn't tried, you could say. Um, harsh land super ego was out in force with, uh, with uh, Jeremy Corbyn, you know, with the Labour Party. Oh, this isn't going to work. This kind of thing doesn't work. You know, um, but what is going to work? What, what, what would work? You know, only a complete transformation of everything, which is, you know, which is. Not really imaginable. Um, so you, I mean, so what typically happens is, you know, there is a model of political transformation, you know, uh, Bolshevik sort, um, which is posited as the only way to really change things. Um, and you know, anything that falls short of that will be regarded as having failed. Of course, the fact that the Bolshevik Revolution ultimately failed, failed straight away, some would argue, is, you know, is, 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 um, is no good to recommend to this at all. Um, so I think we can, I mean, at least I, I can strongly sympathise with what they're seeing there, this left and right um, And moralism, I think, then, um, and, and another important essay by Wendy Brown, which they refer to, Wounded Attachments. Wounded Attachments is highly prophetic to uh, today's left-wing world, or, or aspects of today's left-wing world, really. Um, but what um, Brown does in Winded Attachments is draw upon Nietzsche to show that um, the, the ways in which certain kind of left-wing desire has been mobilized um, in order to um, or one like that, such that identities are defined in relation to wound, to, to the kind of wounding. Um, moralism, she said, provi they say, provides an emotional shoring up of the reactive stance of the weak who define themselves in opposition to the strong. To this solution in recent times of positive projects of socialist construction, left moralism has been energised by increasing investments in injury, failure, and victimhood. And, you know, that's the point of Brown's essay there. When power is identified with what is ruthless and dominating, becomes something the left must distance itself from, lest it be co-opted or compromised. So the, the idea is that the power itself is pathological. To hold power is um, to inherently be oppressive. Therefore, um, but, um, you know, it's, be it's better to be wounded. It's better to be the, the wounded, the abjected. Um, because you're not, you're not actually holding power, which is a person. So this then becomes a, this becomes a, a name for the kind of impossible desire in lots of ways. Um, 
because you know who is the, who is this who is the, who are these appeals aimed at? Um, what what is a positive, what is a political project that she doesn't aim at capturing power in some way or, or building power in some way? Um, I mean, I think at least I think we can recognise the ways in which these this form of um, desire has shaped a lot of African politics recently. I think that's you know um, Brown's essay highly. Um, both of those, with attachments and um, on the left wing code, which builds on Benjamin's discussion with the left wing code. Um. Okay, so let me just carry on, but let's just make the same point then. So, there's more. So, if you, if, so in a way, in, the, in place of a positive political project, we have a moralistic project of condemnation. Um, we condemn those in power. Theory impl implications with, uh, with those in power we become attached to guarding and demonstrating our purity rather than mucking around their everyday politics. Those who engage in such work may find themselves accused of betraying their values, sleeping with the enemy, fighting the devil, all manner of transgressions and betrayals. It's sort of what Interesting how that, that accusation comes from two angles, you could say. Um, one is from this position of uh, of the wounded, who say you should never, um, you know, never truck with existing uh, power at all, and also comes from the position of the, those who would uh, have ultimate power, like Leninists. You know, they they would make the same criticism as well. Don't be tainted by don't be tainted by any attempt to engage with their currently existing political structures or structures of power. Because you know they will, uh, they will be compromised like that. And then they, um, yeah, I mean, kind of. I, I like their analysis, but the films are awful, aren't they? I mean, have you seen them? That people, I doubt anyone is not British. Um, well, you've probably seen, you've probably seen um, uh, *The Full Monty*. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible how, how, how they literally say they're ecstatic about it. I mean, uh, 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 you know, uh, yeah. I, I, those are the films I, I can't say I like them, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've sort of gone against my own aesthetic preferences. I think, like, including that. But um, but no, that's the analysis. I think then. I think they just write with something like Brass Off. I don't think you've even seen that film. You sort of feel you know what it's about. <laughs> you know, Brass Band and Colliery. You know, it's all, it's all there, this kind of left melancholia attached to this kind of uh, nostalgia for these older forms of kind of masculine labour, you know, and this fixation on. I, I think, you know, part of the problem is this fixation on resistance, actually. Just part of this kind of reactive model, um, you know, capital uh, capital does stuff. We resist it. Um, so, yeah. So the, the, I, I think they rightly identified them as the, 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 the impasses of this modernist class politics as they call it, in, um, in something like brass art, just being exemplifying what they're doing. Um, so how do we overcome this? Then, according to them, then. Um, dislocation. We can be on capitalocentrism. Um, we can begin to unfix economic identity by deconstructing the dominant capitalocentric discourse of the economy in which the capitalist and economic activity has taken the model for all economic activity. To dislocate unity and hegemony of neoliberal global capitalist discourse through proliferative querying of the economic landscape and constructing a new language of economic diversity. And this, I think the key thing for them, like, it's the key time for them, is the idea of there is no econ there's no such thing as the economy. So the idea of the economy definite article is fact. It is a kind of fiction, um, a kind of operative fiction, um, which is this is what secures capitalist hegemony. The, the, in the, the empirical level of empirical reality, the world is, you know, the, 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 there, was, there are multiple kind of economic activities. 
Um, but the level of kind of uh, hegemonic narrative is all about capitalism. And it's all, um, it, it, it can be. So the, um, you know, capitalocentrism is kind of what capital does, but it's, I think they worry about re reproducing it uh, in terms of lateral theory and practice. Um, so they've got this model there, then you know, if, if you look at what goes on in the world, they say, why do labor uh, produce from the market in a capitalist firm is a tiny thing when we look at all of the other forms of work. And they go on schools and street neighborhoods and families unpaid, retire between friends, get the basic point. Um, so that, you know, if you take this model then, this, there is not one economy, there's lots of different forms of, um, of, of engagement in the So the, the, the most of the economy is already non-capitalist. Um, so they argue that, and it's partly I think to escape what I call harsh Lenin, super ego, these Leninist models, they think that what we need is um, alternative organizational forms uh, inspired by feminist experimentation, organizational horizontalism, direct and participation, non-monopoly of the spoken word or information, rotation of occasional tasks and responsibilities, non-specialization of functions, non-delegation of power. And so, the, the, what I mean, the, the thing is then, what they're saying is you, you can make massive change, that's what this second long quote is saying, without the need for a vanguard party of the Leninist sort. No, but by Leninism, simply meaning the idea of that the, the revolution will be led by a small elite in a political party. The party organizes the, uh, the, the subordinated class um, and leads them. Uh, they're arguing for this more horizontalist model then um, coming out of feminism. The body practices self-cultivation and placed actions, etc. Um, and so a new set of affects. Coming community are not very interested in their politics. And so it's not outrage and anger, but not cynicism, righteousness, um, wonder, delight, etc. Uh, in this utopian atmosphere, distrust, recognition, and judgment are temporarily suspended, and the solidarity develops in faith, not the same as, but on the growing recognition that the other is not made itself possible. And a really desperate uh, Get out of the full Monty is still issue. You know what? The, the full Monty, you know what happens, right? So it's a lot. Um, it's in Sheffield, isn't it? So they, they were. It's Sheffield, is it? I think so. Yeah. Uh, Northern town in England, anyway. Big problem on employment. Uh, uh, men are miserable. Uh, what do they do? Uh, they decide to um, take up stripping, basically. Um, so some. So, Gibson, Brian, for that, this is, you know, released as this new affect, um, you know, uh, released from this old form of masculinity, which is good. But uh, I think it's, she's the ex-critique, uh, I think it, they, which is sort of, they mentioned. But is this not just a form of entrepreneurialism? Isn't this just a form of factualism? Like, you know, the factories have closed, will then make, you know, make our own business. I mean, obviously, then they're getting something different from that. And that's what they're referring to. And I think, you know, the thing to take, these other forms of affect, are important. Um, I mean, part of the story I would say, that a big story I want to say is, um, um, I want to be pushing uh, over, the, over this module is, resenting more versus, you know, uh, what is the alternative to resenting more? We talk about this when we, you know, um, uh, look at uh, Carl Friedman's work on Nixon. But I mean, you know, the, the neoliberal program is, despite its emphasis on freedom, etc., is really, I think, a lot about resenting. Um, and what are the alternatives to that? Um, you know, solidarity is one word for that. But I think actually, we can understand 
<coughs> tainted by association with, with Leninism for me. Uh, I, I, what about a word like fellowship, I think, is, you know, how does that develop? What are the spaces and conditions for that? I think this is one thing we'd like to take out of this kind of um, So they talk about community economy versus a mainstream and capitalist economy. So I'm going to speed up a bit um, in the rest of the book. Just so, easy. so these are the kind of principles we talk about. Surviving together well and equitably, distributing surplus to enrich social environmental health, encountering others in ways to support their well-being as well as ours, consuming sustainably, caring for, maintaining, replenishing, and growing our natural and cultural commons. Investing our wealth in future generations so they can live as well. So, an economy centered on these ethical considerations is what we call a community economy, a space of decision making where we recognize and negotiate our interdependence with other humans, other species, and our environment. The process of recognizing and negotiating we become a community. Okay, so this is the, this is the model. We notice how. Some of this is the um, sound of controversy in the mainstream rhetoric. I think bank adverts could have incorporated this in there. So, you know, sustainability is, doesn't mean they're really going to do it. But it, uh, I think it indicates the pressure that some of these discourses are about to on the mainstream. Okay, is this just folk politics, though? I guess this is the question. Right. Um, so there's the, um, the diagram of <coughs> the economy. That's a community economy. So economy is asymmetrical and global, community is place attached, economy is specialised, community is diversified, economy is centred, community economy is decentered, privately owned, community owned, etc. So we can get the picture. Um, right, so, but is this just folk politics? So, so this concept of folk politics then developed by uh, Alex Williams and uh, Nick Sterling. Uh, partly because of, as I said, the failures of um, post-2008-2009 uh, anti-capitalism. No, there's a certain level of success of the groups that are the key, but they, that was limited. Um, and according to uh, Nick and Alex, that was because of, you know, one of the reasons for that was that the influence of folk politics. Um, and so they argue that the most important division in today's left is between the hold of folk politics and localism, direct action, and relentless horizontalism, and those that outline what must be Kind of an accelerationist, become called an accelerationist project that ease with the modernity and abstraction, complexity, globality, and technology. The former remains content with establishing small and temporary space of non capitalist social relations, assuring the real problems in terms of facing foes which are increasingly non local, abstract, and rooted deep in our everyday structure, infrastructure. The failure of such politics has been built in from the very beginning. By contrast, an accelerationist project seeks to preserve the gains of left capitalism while going further with its value system, governance structures, and mass pathologies to allow. Um, I'll give some description of my own politics in that sense. Sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry, yeah, no, no, it's quite um, it's rhetorical. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is what Gibson and Graham posing kind of folk politics in that sense. Um, the take term folk politics, it comes from um, the critique of folk psychology that was developed by um, neurophilosophers. Neurophilosophers um, argue that folk psychology is no good. The concepts that we have in our everyday life, including things even like emotions, the way we describe what goes on in, what, in our brains, it has no use for what actually goes on in the brain. And it really inhibits the study of what the brain actually does. Um, and in the same way that, so Nick and I are taking this analogy, to, uh, uh, working with an analogy then with um, political process, arguing that 
the, 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 the spontaneous concepts that we have in everyday life um, to understand uh, you know, political system, just simply the political economic system, simply have no purchase on um, the reality of something like capitalism, of, you know, finance, capital, etc. Um, we, we, you know, there's the, the, the a kind of mismatch between the two. And it would seem, on the face of it, that um, the, you know, the tension between the, 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 Gibson Graham, something could be fall into fake policy. I don't think they fully do actually, because there's you know there is the, the, there is a model of the, the model of hegemonic takeover. <coughs> it's not they just think you can operate locally. There has to be some kind of hegemonic struggle. But nonetheless, I think we can see a tension already then between uh, the approach of economic self-take and the manifesto for acceleration of policy. Um, and, and the Gibson Graham approach. Um, so, I mean, as they did, but as they developed their argument in this book, which some of you got, the man of um, inventing a future, um, you know, their, their claims become somewhat softer than they, 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 they were in acceleration of manifesto, if you mean Graham. Um, as we, so, have you seen them? Um, so partly that the, how we get there, we need demand at all. So there's, you know, there has been a talk of a politics without demands or demandless politics. They're saying, well, demands are crucial. Um, politics without demands is simply a collective aimless body to provocative plan. Um, and these demands, they should say, should take the form of non-reformist reforms. And then must, with these reforms have a utopian and antagonistic components and are based on actual tendencies of work in the world today. So, um, there's kind of pragmatic interventions. Um, so, let's quickly go through what their actual demands are. Um, full automation, without full automation, post-capitalism, post-capitalist futures, and so we choose upon us the expense of freedom, echoing the works and tristy of Soviet Russia, or the freedom and the expense of abundance represented by the primitivist utopia. And how much freedom can you really have with, with, without abundance anyway? Um, that's fine. Okay, so full automation. So the, the arguments of full automation are can lead to a society that by its humanity from drudgery while also increasing the human well. It also be happening. 3.7 and it's present today jobs are paid for the It can lead to a revaluation and elimination of care work. Allowing a radical transformation of the domestic sphere. Um, demand for a produced working week. I mean, this is interesting, isn't it? That how this stopped. You know, there, there was pressure, the down, the pressure to get the uh, working week down. Um, the introduction of the weekend. Now it's kind of stuck at forty hours and going up in this regard. Particularly the nature of sort of post forward labour. Um, so it's a positive response to rising information. So um, rather than, I mean, you know, the capitalist dystopia which we're in at the moment, the more automation there is, the more, more miserable things are, right? But because it means just uh, less work, um, more unemployment, means that uh, the um, power of workers in jobs is much weakened. Um, reduced working week would have environment advantages, less commuting, less uh, forms of consumption associated with going into work, and increase the power of workers. Um, because if, you know, if dystopian model of automation decrease the power of workers, then this would, would increase. Universal basic income um, must be sufficient and universal, so it's, it mustn't, so it must be enough to live on. And, um, 
a supplement to, to the argument to supplement the existing welfare system and a replacement for it because that would be the right thing to actually universal basic income. Fourth, the arguments for it. political transformation. So the proposed applicants subsist without the job, which will increase that class power. <coughs> Precarity is transformed to flexibility of the workers' terms, and as they point out, you know, a lot of post-Fordism was a kind of capitalist, is the capitalist genie responding to the wishes of workers in a malevolent way. Okay, so you don't want to be bored in a factory forever. You know, you think, um, you know, you think of being, you don't want to be bored in a factory 40 years, fine. You know, have um, temporary or casual labour. Um, so changes now with work is valued. So, you know, the boring and repetitive work would have to be higher paid if you've got universal basic income. If you've got universal basic income, you're not going to go into, you're not going to do boring work. But who decides to do the boring work? I mean, well, maybe well, someone is, you know, enjoying the factory and that's not boring. Um, well, maybe okay, but I mean, um, that, but, but the thing is that workers could, the point is that workers themselves could decide what, what they want to do or not much more. No one has to decide that this is a classic. You know, in a sense, the market can decide what is boring work. And I guess you can see already, like, no one in the UK, like, it's not really, like, quite... No, I do understand that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just would... I mean, no, yeah, it wouldn't be decided. It would be... It would be the, the, um, yeah, it's just the market mechanisms would decide it, wouldn't it? Because so you'd, you'd have to induce people to do things which... Yeah, some, some people might find it. Some people might find it. That, that'd be great for them, though, wouldn't yeah. it? Uh, it'd be even better for them. Uh, because uh, they would, if, if they found... If some people found boring work, what well, most people find boring work to be interesting, in this world, they'd be much better, they'd, they'd be much better off than they are now, right? Yeah. Um, about, like, yeah. inflation? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know, like, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's a bit like, it's like, this is literally, what, I'm from Finland, so like, okay. there's, there's just like, started UBI, but that's like, to kind of, um, to dismantle the, like, welfare state, yeah. yeah. Um, but what I was taught in, like, high school was that, like, you know, like, once live, like, once wages go up, then, like, you know, like, then the inflation goes up too, so, like, you can't, you know, like, we were taught that, you know, it's, like, really bad to kind of raise salaries. Like what's the what's the like UBI kind of uh, <laughs> relation between? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know anything about economics. Really. <laughs> I'm trying to skip over this thing. Economics. What's necessary? What's necessary? Maybe we're thinking in a capitalist framework. Frame frame. Yeah. or a Keynesian frame, and this kind of measures needs another frame, another economical frame. So inflation maybe is not not an issue here. I mean, it because we are demanding another kind of economy. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it wouldn't automatically lead to inflation, would it? Because, but, I mean, the thing is, that's why it has to be sufficient. The UBI has to be sufficient for people to live on. But if everyone, so like, I don't know, like, say in Finland, like, everyone's yeah. now getting, like, a thousand euros a month. Yeah. Like, would it, would it, like, wouldn't it still mean that, like, I mean, maybe I want to still kind of get more money, because I want to go to, I don't know, like, to London or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then I would still, like, want to have, like, a highly paid job, so it would kind of just mean that, like, I would still get, like, you know, like, I would get more and more money, because you still need, like, the kind of, Separate issue to the inflation one, isn't it, really? 
Um, and I guess it's yeah. like, well, I guess the, the argument of like not getting rid of welfare states, but you still kind of have, you, you're still entitled to your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think the UBI has to be adjusted, I suppose, because it remains sufficient. Um, Yeah, so then drifting off a bit. <laughs> um, but also, I mean, I think that it's, you know, that, um, it might be your name, so. Eloy. Eloy, yeah. That's Eloy saying, isn't it partly that shifting us out of this? I think part of why they think it's, why they propose it is that it starts to shift us out of this certainly neoliberal capitalist model into some other space, which isn't really difficult to imagine. What would it be like if there was actually a sufficient, sufficient UBI? Um, we can start to flip it, it does start to flip our minds, doesn't it? The things that are available now. So, okay, so hang on. If, if the UBI and people won't do this shit work, won't do drudgery, ah, oh, well, hang on. Have we then got automation? Isn't automation then uh, come in to, 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 take a, to take on the role of this drudgery? And so, you know, think, so it just flips everything. So, what is the problem now? Um, automation. Becomes a, becomes a posit positivity. Um, no, this isn't directly answering what you're saying, but it's more that then I think that this is why it's a sort of revolutionary reform in that it starts to shift um, at the basic coordinates and models of, of, um, of life, work, and society. Exactly. Would you also get though some industries being completely neglected and then others massively developing because of the, for example, like <clears throat> I mean, yeah. To be fair, the creative sector even now is like less well. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> it's interesting, but yeah. then in this imaginary, would you, would that get neglected altogether? Because it would be, I don't know, would there be any incentives? But not, I mean, no one that no one really does, like, I mean, I'm a designer and I, I don't do design because, like, I get paid for it. I do, I do it because I love to do it. And I would do it more if I were, if, if there was UBI. Mm -hmm. And you would do, like, projects that are actually valuable for rather than, like, the ones that you get paid for. Yeah, but I kind of wonder about whether, I don't know, there's something there about like the fact that that isn't built into that value system that's any given this idea that we should just enjoy it and get through it and just enjoy it. I don't know, is that a positive thing for you, Paul? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's only, but, um, there's only one aspect potentially, isn't it? It's not the only thing. That would, be, would necessarily be happening um, because partly it's about shifting the, the, the emphasis away from remuneration altogether, isn't it? Yeah. So it's you know, I mean, that key thing. I think Gibson's right. The key thing is diverse economy with Nick and Alex's kind of post-work right. So you're shifting away from work and remuneration as a model anyway. Um, so the fact that you know the fact that people. Mm, could engage in this creative work, okay, yeah. yeah, without necessarily being remunerated at a high, le high level. Well, you know, in, in, in as we start to move it towards that post-capitalist world, d does remuneration matter that so much anyway? So it's more that at the moment it's that idea of rewarding work is being exploited rather than in the current system. Yeah, itself. potentially, yeah. But I, mean, I, I guess the I mean, kind of things, the modesty of them, the model isn't, I think, that, 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 that it's, it's, move, it's moving with existing tendencies um, somewhere that actually quite quickly takes us some, uh, a place that seems far beyond where we actually are at the moment. Even though it's, it's you know, feasible, it's sort of logistically feasible, and not that big a step in the world. Um, there's the cleverness of it. So families propose also they're saying because it allows experimentation in family structure. Um, um, no one brethren. So versus the link between suffering and remuneration, which is you know, from, I think this is key to kind of the, the, the almost religious dimensions of the, what they're talking about, the work ethic, which was the Protestant work ethic, you know, which was a kind of religious valuation of suffering. Suffering intrinsically value in itself. 
counter-hegemonic approach which can draw upon all the existing hatred of jobs. Counter-hegemonic, and this is a book that's um, photographed from a program that was on a couple of years ago, which some of you may remember, Benefit Street, which can be highly controversial. Typical of the kind of thing. Channel 5 in the UK specialises in these programmes basically about that people on benefits. Um, and stoking up resenting them against them, really. You know, um, the idea that, um, you know, somehow their lives are better, they can be on benefits, but uh, it's better to be them than you. You, the middle, you know, you belong to the middle, the hard-working middle, you know, chipping ice off your windscreen, and, uh, going to work at, uh, in, the, in the winter, you know. Um, and but, but what that really reveals is that people think their jobs are shit, right? That people hate their own jobs, which is why they think that it's better to be on benefits. And, um, um, uh, you know, in work. Okay, let's quickly go to some of Paul Mason's stuff. Sorry, I've never been out of time. I'm trying to pack it up today. But, um, the, so Paul Mason's stuff is based on this thing of kind of conversity of ways and in, 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 in economy here. Um, it, this was an idea of uh, um, the idea that capitalism renewed itself for, um, through long waves of development, um, and you know I think he sort of fuses this with a bit of um, autonomy um, uh, theories from um, of, of the the really capitalism is driven by the uh, it's partly driven by the antagonism of the working class, but when a working class resists capital. Um, when it struggles against it, it forces capitalism to, to innovate. So part of the problem will be at the moment is, is that the very success of capitalism in subduing the working class means that it lock, gets locked in stasis. This could account for why there's this downfall um, with flatlining gr growth uh, rates and things like that, um, economic stuff. <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, I just uh, I, I can't point. I won't point to be an expert on economics at all. So, although it's about it, 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 the cultural dimensions of this, which I um, have a reasonable grasp on. Anyway. Um, so, uh, so, 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 and really, what a lot of Mason stuff really is is, is um, really about information, isn't it? This is what he, 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 he keeps emphasising. Um, Peter Drucker's post capitalist society. Peter Drucker's a management consultant. Um, I love this book. It would be interesting to read that. Um, he thinks centrality of knowledge in, a, in this post capitalist economy. Universal educated person. This uh, would be the centre of that. This would be the network individual from to Mason. Um, So, uh, according to Mason, then the, the, the key thing is the emergence of information and of kind of, of knowledge-based um, goods, info goods, which are, as it, he says, the, uh, operate by principle of non-rivalry. And in fact, the opposite of that. I mean, it's a, you know, if I've got this pen, you don't have it. It's physical. Uh, whereas, if you know, if uh, if I have a PDF of Mason's book, it doesn't stop you having one um, either. You know, it, 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 um, information works like that. In lots of ways, the fact we've all got it makes it, it better for all of us. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't lose anything by the fact you've got it. Um, so this introduces, according to him, I think, I, I, this then introduces this new principle, which is contradictory to capitalism. And, you know, the, Basic law of economics, or say with capitalist economics, everything is scarce. It isn't. You know, you can keep replicating digital files, uh, practically added to an item, then it's scarce. Um, open source versus Microsoft. Um, could Wikipedia have been created by capitalist dynamics alone? You know, so could, if by market incentivization and no, clearly, some people are motivated by other things than um, profit. Otherwise, 
you know, um, Wikipedia wouldn't exist. So for him, then, it's a common space peer-to-peer -peer production. This open source form of produ um, production is going to threaten the capitalist corporate model of um, um, profit-based um, economy. So I'm rushing through so we can just allow a bit more, a bit of time for discussion. So he refers then to general intellect again, the influence, the influence of autonomy, and Negri and the like. Uh, the first, the leap on the emergence of this um, text from Marx. Um, that of a general intellect, you know, a knowledge based society um, in which workers kind of stood by the supervised machines. Um, supervised rather than operating machines. Um, and certain knowledge is socialised in this world. In a, in a general intellect. So yes, it becomes about knowledge and sociality. Um, so, um, okay, not much more. Um, so, I think probably is the key claim. Technologically, we're headed for zero price goods, unmeasurable work, an exponential takeoff in productivity, and extensive automation of physical processes. Socially, we are trapped in a world of monopolies, inefficiency, the ruin of a finance dominated free market, and proliferation of bullshit jobs, <coughs> which is uh, David Graver's phrase. Uh, read that essay if you want to read it, um, it's really good. Um, today, the main contradiction in modern capitalism is between the possibility of free abundant socially produced goods and a system of monopolies, banks, and governments struggling to maintain control over power and information. Everything is pervaded by a fight between network and hierarchy. In fact, the capitalism has a tendency to income and quality information monopolies, financial power is running out of steam. It's time to start figuring something new. Okay. So for him, it's this, in, this info knowledge model um, which is the key threat to, to capitalism. He sees it then as analogous with the kind of um, collapse of, of feudalism um, and emergence of capitalism itself. Um, so Five principles of transitioning are these. Uh, we have to understand the limits of human willpower. This is not understood by um, uh, you know, Leninists, the kind of classic kind of Leninist left wing parties. We thought that like, voluntarism would be enough to overcome capitalism. Ecological sustainability um, must change human beings as well as. This as the economies, as not just, we, we must, it's about changing ours, not just something outside that's called the economy. So that surely echoes Gibson Gray and White, that's a lot of what their work is about. And you could say that their work is really emphasizes that, perhaps above everything else. Um, and perhaps that to be, um, you know, to adopt a perspective of perhaps the manifesto of acceleration of politics, it's, it's the emphasis on that without the other stuff that perhaps makes it vote for it. Take the problem from all angles. Um, so again, it's, it's, it requires kind of diversity, I think, echoing Gibson Gray and Gray. Maximize the power of information. So um, I think that's it's about transparency, about um, knowledge, um, linking, perhaps the link with the WikiLeaks and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so his steps would be so we need an accurate and open source computer simulation of current economic reality which he thinks we, it's, it's possible because of the this computing power that's available now which is not, was not possible in previous forms of history um, shift to a wiki state model switch off the privatisation model, reshape markets towards sustainable collaborative and social just outcomes, make space for collaborative peer-to-peer and non-profit activities, force corporations to drive change, suppress the socialised monopolies, let market forces disappear. Some markets can survive, but it's the difference between market forces and markets, uh, I think. It's quite interesting. Um, not, um, and the, He's saying that in, in energy, in order to put in place of sustainability, market forces must be suppressed entirely. Socialised financial system, finance system, 
Economic diversity and kind of production, new kind of subjectivity in the class is their own um, With um, Nick and Alex, then it's those demands um, of um, basic income, automation, um, um, universal, yeah, that's it, it's the main one. Um, Automation, reduced working with universal basic income, to the sh sort of shift of post work. And with Paul Mason, then it's this kind of info, info, info knowledge model of a kind of open source politics. Um, right, so what do people think? We've got to think. Have we rushed through Mason a bit? What, um, just would like to hear what people's initial thoughts are. Rank them. Which are the best? Which is which are the worst? Um, When I was reading um, the text, I just, I just kept, um, I was thinking of an article I just read about a, a kind of like really trendy um, leader or like a CEO of a company, and he said he, he had like a burnout because he was uh, forced to kind of um, self, um, but like he, he was, he was working in a in a um, job where he didn't have any like hierarchy, so actually no one was telling him what to do, okay. and then that like meant that he. Just like had a burnout, he couldn't, he didn't know what to do, and he was like having difficulty, like self managing himself, and and then like I was just wondering, like in relation to the kind of like part of the working ethic, like like you know like just this like uh, no pain, no gain. Yeah. Like so, what 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 happens if you don't have to work? Like would you not even do the kind of like fun Wikipedia stuff, or like you know would people just come in lazy, right? Like I don't know, like this is something I wanted to. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's, 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 it's but I mean the, the, the people. It's a good question, right? I mean, it's, it, but it's bleak, isn't it? Like, um, it, like people, the people don't. I mean, it, it isn't Wikipedia already the answer to that? The Wikipedia it isn't well. They don't get paid for it. Like, well, like two hundred people do do amazing or whatever get paid for it. So most people who are contributing to it don't aren't working. So they, that's already the answer to that. Yeah, but I just wanted, like, I don't know, even, even like, like, I mean, now that I'm in the uni, like, I've been reading a lot, right? Like, because I'm, I'm forced to read a lot. So then, like, I'd like to read a lot also when I'm not here, but I don't get, I don't do it because I'm not forced to. So I don't know, like, what, what do you feel like? Because this is kind of, I feel like this is the argument of, like, neo liberalism that, like, like, once you're in a job, you get, you know, you get stuff done because you have to, right? And, like, what happens if, you, if you're not in that context? Mm -hmm. No, no, that, that, that's, that's, I mean, it, it is a good question, but it's other than isn't culture, but a lot of cultural production, the answer to that. Given that, you know, this sort of comes back to some issues raised by who doesn't. It? The fact that, um, the fact that sort of most culture that's produced is not remunerated at all, never mind about in a small way. Um, you could argue that it would increase cultural production. Yeah, it would, surely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you'd have more, everyone would have more time. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I guess part of this, I mean, I think this is right, this is good, right? I think we need to. Well, you need to call it cultural production. I mean, that is also the question. <coughs> I mean, the different kinds of culture that are produced under different circumstances get them. I mean, maybe just some of the most amazing things that people write. Because they are they're suffering from a system that they don't want to be exploited by. But imagine just there's nothing bad out there. And well, I mean, okay, I think that's <laughs> what I have. <laughs> I, mean, the, I mean, the most interesting pieces of culture have always been counterculture. But I, I'm just thinking about what would be counterculture in a coastal society. Hey, okay, right. Well,
Right, I mean, I think it's, okay. This, 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 is, this is really interesting, but it does show the influence of this cult, this cult of suffering that, they, that Nick and Alex talk about. The idea of that suffering is a crucial kind of thing. We can't, that, that's one thing, um, which, but that's not, that's not necessarily uh, repudiating what you're saying. Well, the but it is I don't think self-government moves as a... No, that's the second claim, yeah. It's some kind of race sublimation of, of you know, your capacity to uh, do something else instead, you know, with more time. Uh, it just means that... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, we still face... I mean, <coughs> we still face mortality. I mean, we still face um, loss. And, I mean, work isn't the only source of suffering. I mean, so that just sounded a bit sarcastic, but you know, but, 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 um, yeah, uh, that you know, the other forms of suffering would be there. I mean, of course, the full Promethean ambition would be to eliminate mortality as well, which you know the Soviets at some point thought that was <coughs> possible. Why not? I mean, that you know, what are the limits? I mean, this is Prometheanism, would be, um, yeah. But Alice, I think you wanted to say. Well, I was just going to say, like, also, should we like the question of sort of like leisure time would be. You'd have to like reevaluate what that is in the face of like post work things. So like the I I don't know, like yeah, like why you'd make stuff the impetus would be a different there'd be a different sort of drive to it and like yeah, I don't know if I just can think about that and think of more. I mean surely like we've got a but but look it's I mean I just think about the beat of let's say. In effect, you know, what is a what did a post work society look like? It's kind of what the life was like for them, wasn't it? They didn't have to work. You know, they said but they, they you know they didn't um, they, they you know they they you know made enough money surely by the early sixties to just not, not work anymore. Then their most interesting experimental stuff emerged. Their most interesting experimental stuff emerged because they were you know, partly because they were freed from the pressure of having to um, worry about selling it, and she sold more anyway. But, but, but you know, like, um, is that is that silly example or not? I mean, it isn't. But um, you know, it, it isn't that what I think. Isn't that what haunts us about the '60s counterculture? Uh, is that it was a, this sort of post? What some indication of what a post-work society was? Um, that was, and, and you know, and that's part of all of that was made possible by sort of reinforcing the old um, because partly because people got you know grants to go to art school and, and the like you know and, uh, were freed up from the pressures of, 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 uh, of, of, of drudgery for a while so, so I think we've got some indication um, of what a post-work society would look like in terms of yeah cultural production but of course that doesn't necessarily answer your point because that was still in the context of uh, a broader society of work, but as I say, I mean, if you think about the Beatles, or, or you know, any successful artist who carries on working does interesting stuff. Uh, you know, aren't they? Aren't, aren't they the argument against that? But the, you know, they. You know, it, you know, if it was, if if the, if if only their, their early work was interesting, right? When, when they were when immediately freed up from the pressure of work, I think your argument would be valid. But if, if after a period of time, when they're effectively liberated from the pressure of work, their work, con their work continues, work is, you know, is work the right word now? For the, that they're, what they're producing continues to be interesting and in fact becomes more interesting, doesn't it suggest that, you know, uh, you don't need that, at least that form of suffering really to engender. It's interesting. The myth of like this, like creativity can only occur when you're suffering, which is like, I mean, in, in my opinion, it's bullshit. There might not be a myth. I mean, I think. Or like for me, can, at least. No, but I mean, it might. I mean, no, no I mean, I, I mean, it might be a myth. It might not be a myth. But I mean, the thing is, um, it's, it's, a bit un it's a bit hard to test that, I think, because we're in a world of suffering, so we don't know what a, what a world of suff world without suffering would be like. But what I'm saying is. We do know what a world, we've got some sense of what a world without certain kinds of suffering would be like, because we've seen what happens to certain people when they're, when they're released from it. 
Um, so, okay, this is a good this is a good start, isn't it? I think it's the kind of thing we want to be thinking about, and it death directly relates to what Marcuse would, would want to talk about is, is these questions actually. Um, so, can I would like every week if someone to introduce the text, not me. Um, uh, you can introduce it however you like. It doesn't have to be a formal presentation, but just to start off talking about them. Um, so it's not me who's starting off, and obviously I've done it today. Um, and I'll probably do something like this for next week as well, just as a sort of backup. But um, it's far too much of me talking today. Um, but you know, I think we've we, we ended up in the right space of more discussion. And would anyone like to volunteer then to do Marcuse for next week? I'll do it. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, anyone, no, no. anyone do the Adam Willis? It's not that, I mean... Not oh, thank you very much. Okay, so, um, if you, you know, if you wanted to do handouts or PowerPoints or whatever, you can do that. If you don't, you know, or, or you can just raise a few points, whatever you want to do. We just, so you're starting off, not me. Just like a few minutes, or is it like... Yeah, yeah, a few yeah. minutes, yeah, 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 just a few minutes. Um, yeah. Um, just, just a few key points, things you want to discuss, um, etc. Um, okay, so that's... That's that, that's the first one. <laughs> okay, can people who came in late... Uh, I'm just going through the structure as I see it uh, at the moment. But as I say, you know, you can contribute to that, you can shape it. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's an open experiment, uh, this course, starting now, really. Okay, well, what I was going to do to start off was. Um, you know, the negative talk of 